Okay, we just heard that song. And just a little behind the scenes discussion for the listeners. We we talked about how we would approach this jazz, uh, this album and jazz as a whole, since, as John said, none of us are experts on jazz. So um, Eric Dolphy's life, um, I'm going to talk about the album and Eric Dolphy's life. Does that mean that we're experts in all this other stuff? Like, are we are we at that level, do we think? Well, I... I would say we've listened to those albums more than we have jazz albums, unless we're just going to zigzag. We just don't suck as much at those areas, (laughs) Josh. We we suck less. Yes. We're more, we're more confident in our opinions. Yes. Um, So um, about Eric Dolphy, this album is from 1964. It's a, it's a posthumous album. Uh, Eric Dolphy unfortunately died at the age of 36. So he had a, a lot, uh, you know, a short um, life, unfortunately but it was productive he had a lot of recordings he was a in my opinion he was a genius listening to this album and reading and learning about him and hearing um, or reading what others thought about him Um, he was born on June 20th 1928 Um, he died June 29th 1964 uh, in Berlin he was in um, Europe touring at the time um, playing music and um, I'll get into his death at the end but um he was born and raised in la um his parents were from um panama and um he started learning music at age six um he played music all through school um you know middle school high school college um he learned and he had learned multiple instruments by high school um by college he was recording music um he was in the army for a time starting in 1950 for a few years and then when he got out, he basically started playing music again professionally. Um, he received his big break in 1958 when he was invited to join Chico Hamilton's quintet. And he toured with them um, for a couple years. And then he moved, he, he decided to leave the band and he moved to New York City in 1960, where he played with Charles Mingus. Um, he would play with. Um, Charlie Mingus on and off um, throughout the remaining of his years until 1964. Um, He also played with John Coltrane in 1961. So he was, he was very well respected um, among his peers. And so he played with all the, the great um, jazz people of the time. Um, Based on my research, he either played in or led multiple different bands across the country and Europe during the sixties. So unlike, you know, a lot of the other artists that we talk about, he was a, he was a working musician. So he would play where the work was and where he, um, you know, could get gigs and stuff. And um, so that caused him to travel. Um, And this was a guy based on everything that I read and watched. um, He, he basically, uh, you know, ate, um, dreamed and and worked music, and that's all he did. That was his life. He didn't have any other hobbies. He, um, you know, practiced. There's stories of him practicing eight hours a day. He would practice after, you know, after the practices uh, for the gigs he was doing, and after shows, he wouldn't go out and party. He would go practice more. Um, he, which you know, leads to you being really good at something, um, and. Um, and as a result, he was a singular, um, musician in the bass clarinet, um, in the flute and in the alto saxophone. Um, those were his primary instruments. Um, in early 1964, he went to Europe with Charles, with Charles Mingus, uh, Charles Mingus's sextet and toured there. Um, he had planned to stay in Europe after this, um, and, Basically, my understanding is he was kind of disillusioned with everything going on in the United States at the time with um, with the civil rights movement and kind of the direction of the U.S. Um, he was a he was a black American. I don't and don't know if I need to point that out. But um, and also my understanding is that jazz is kind of thought of differently in Europe and it may be more respected in Europe. And so you can make a better living in Europe playing jazz. You'd make more money, you'd have more gigs, uh, and you were more respected. Um, Unfortunately, that kind of 
ends his story. He was playing a gig um, in Berlin at the time. And um, he, long story short, he was an undiagnosed diabetic um, his whole life. And no one knew, Mm -hmm. including him, what he was. So he was, he was um, constantly eating candy and he had poor nutrition and didn't know um, not just candy, but he was always trying to unintentionally get the sugar that you would need to raise your insulin levels. Um, and he, I think his insulin essentially got too low over the course of a couple of days and he couldn't bring it back up. Um, and so then at a gig, he basically was almost like collapsing on stage. Um, and some of uh, the people that he was with brought him to the hospital. And, um, unfortunately, um, they didn't do anything because they made the assumption that because he was a jazz musician that he was on drugs. Um, and so they were just letting, they said, well, the drugs will just get out of his system. Uh, unbeknownst to them that he was a complete teetotaler and he didn't do any drugs at all. He didn't even um, drink or smoke. Um, and so then he went into insulin shock and died. He went into a coma. God. Um, yeah, really tragic. Um, if, you know, if he had known, if everyone had known that he was diabetic, it could have been easily been treated. Um, well, when you said he died early, I, my first, I mean, jazz, he was doing heroin. Like he was doing a yeah. ton of heroin, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's, I was, that's surprising. He was, um, he wasn't even married at the time. He, he had a fiance. Um, he didn't have any children. Um, he was basically, you know, his life was his music, um, and playing married to the grinds. Yep. Um, you know, I, I watched a doc, the one documentary I could find on him, um, was called, uh, the last date, um, from 1991. And it's by a, a, a Dutch, um, director. And it's basically, you know, a, a recap of his life. And, um, yeah, he would just, um, he would play music in the apartments that he had and he wouldn't even really eat. He, there was a story about him keeping, uh, piles of uh, or bags of beans in his closet and that's all he would eat for like days at a time or weeks at a time because either he wasn't making a lot of money or he just like didn't really take care of himself that way other than through his music um he's buried in los angeles and his uh, headstone bears the inscription he lives in his music um so yeah that's that's the the short version of his bio um I really uh, kind of, I really respected him after hearing his album and, and hearing his story. It's really sad that he died the way he did. Um, You know, it's always sad when it, it's sad when Elaine dies, but when you're as talented as he is and you die so young, um, he's had so much promise. Um, He played, oh, as I said, he played alto sax, bass, clarinet, and flute. um, And, this album, now to the album, he is classified as free jazz or avant-garde jazz, which is in the timeline of jazz kind of on the later end of the spectrum of types of jazz based on my research. I know John did a lot of research on that, so maybe we can talk a little bit about that sure. chronology. Mm-hmm. Um, but free jazz is basically an experimental approach to jazz, and uh, it's heavily improvisational. Um, developed in the late 50s and early 60s when um, the musicians were attempting to change or break down jazz conventions. Um, Europeans also call it just free improvisation as opposed to free jazz. Um, This album, Out to Lunch, is technically a posthumous release. Um, It's not his last uh, recorded work. Um, That would be a little later because they record a lot of the sessions that he was, or some of the sessions that he had when he was in um, Europe in 64, but um, this album's a posthumous release. Uh, it's the only album recorded for Blue Note Studios, which is a famous jazz um, label. And uh, it's Out to Lunch is often considered his, his magnum opus. Um, the people on the on the band uh, or on the album that I wanted to point out besides Eric is um, Freddie Hubbard. He's on trumpet. Bobby Hutcherson's on vibraphone. Um, Richard Davis is on bass. And Tony Williams is on drums. 
Um, Eric plays the bass clarinet on the first two tracks, Hat and Beard, Something Sweet, Something Tender. He plays the flute on the third um, track, Gazzaloni, which is named after a classical flautist, Severino Gazzaloni. And he plays alto sax on tracks four and five, Out to Lunch, and Straight Up and Down. Um, and so, okay, so that's stuff about him. What? Did, how did you guys, I guess my question to you is, what was your what was your entry into jazz and how did you approach listening to this album matt you go first because i'm gonna have a long ass answer um so i i I learned mostly about jazz in a class that i took in college uh essentially the history of jazz so it's interesting because i don't remember learning about eric dolphy i probably did but um I, it, it wasn't stuck in my memory. The main thing I got out of that class was Miles Davis. And, you know, um, the story of Miles Davis was interesting enough for me at the time that that was where I went out and bought, when I bought jazz records, it was mostly Miles Davis um, with, with a, I think I have a Coltrane album too. So I, it's, it's something that I am interested in. Um, I, I was, and I, I was listening to, I was actually watching an episode of Bar Rescue today, and John Taffer was, was tasked with saving a bar, a jazz bar. And Noted jazz I, aficionado, John Taffer. John Taffer, <laughs> mate, but he's got some data, John, that uh, he told the, the, the club owner that jazz represents 2% of the market in the United States. And so it's after hearing a record like this that that totally makes sense, right? Um, mm. I... I generally like listening to jazz in a live context as opposed to just putting on a record. Although I do that from time to time, I really, you know, we're get, it, we're not be, uh, having an opportunity to cover Miles Davis's kind of blue, which is a fantastic jazz record. It's very, um, it's very easy to listen to. Um, it's been considered, you know, the best, it's been, you know, one of the best, if not the best jazz album of all time. Um, but it's, it's certainly not what this is which this is certainly, uh, this is avant-garde, right? This free form, mm-hmm. um, it's all over the place, right? So for, so I can't proclaim to be someone that's, you know, I, that I have a trained ear when listening to jazz, maybe maybe more so than the average person, but certainly, you know, I'm, I'm at best in the middle, I would say. Um, so overall, this was a hard listen for me. I don't mind avant-garde stuff. I don't mind discordant notes, which it seemed to me like was all over the place here, just different instruments playing notes that don't match up well together, um, which, which happens when you're doing this type of freeform jazz. So it's, it can be, it's a tough listen, you know, um, mm-hmm. and you got to be ready for it. I think this is not something you just pop in. So part of this for me, I think was, I never got to a place or a time where I, maybe this would have been a good, a, a better, I would have been in a better frame of mind to listen to this. So, um, and because it's so discordant, it's so free form. Um, like I said, I don't mind that to some extent, but a lot of times I, I, I'd rather have that kind of on the outskirts and have it couched into something a little bit more structured. So when it's, when this is the main thing, it's going to be a tough listen for me. So I can't really, I, I didn't really differentiate too much between a lot of the tracks you know, um, it, it's got some standard stuff within the tracks, you know, in terms of solos, you know, there's long bass mm-hmm. solos or drum solos. And when that happens, you're just, you know, if, if I'm really listening to it, you, it's, it's very, it's not hard to see how well, great these musicians are, can, you know, can how I, talented they are. Can I jump in then? Because I think my part of it might actually facilitate an interesting discussion on us in this, if, if that's okay. So uh, when I, I have a couple friends who are jazz aficionados and I consider myself to be someone who enjoys jazz in a live context. And sometimes from a frame of reference, when I'm looking for music that will set a certain mood, I'll right. search out jazz. But you know, what I, what I've come to realize is there are certain things that I recognize as jazz and certain things that I don't recognize as jazz. And so when I was talking to some of my friends who were really into jazz, they said, you know, Eric Dolphy represents calculus. And what you have to do is, you know, with your listeners, you have to make sure that people understand some of the basic math so that they can work their way to the calculus. And I think that was a great way to describe it um, because it's, you know, as Matt mentioned, it's discordant, it's free form, multiple instrumentations from different players. And then on top of it, they're playing it in ways that are designed to keep you off balance, right? Not to mm-hmm. give you sort of like a signature sound. Uh, and so 
can I real quickly with you guys just go through sort of free jazz sort of represents the eighth stage of jazz, right? So let me real quickly kind of go through the first seven and you guys can tell me what your familiarity with it is. Okay. And I'll give a little bit of like the notes of what makes it right. So step one is the blues of the, you know, the post antebellum era, right? Late 1800s, early 1900s, even before Robert Johnson, who we covered that type of blues. It's just, it's guitar driven. It is usually has singing involved in it. That's soulful and tells hard luck stories. Um, You know, lead belly, Bessie Smith, people like that, right? And then it leads into the Robert Johnsons of the world. I'm very familiar with that type of music and what it sounds like. It's not abstract at all, unlike what we covered today. It's very straightforward with very direct chord progressions. What would you guys say your familiarity is with that type of blues? Yeah, more definitely more familiar than this. Um, but gotcha. Basically, yeah. Blues is, blues is all pretty much all I'm familiar. <laughs> I mean, it's right. Crazy. Okay. So, so we all. I guess what I'm saying is we all have that foundation, which is pretty much a straightforward blues foundation, right? Then the next step to building to what jazz becomes is adding in what's known as ragtime, right? And that's you know, Scott Joplin's the guy who's most known as ragtime, right? And that is where you take sort of the the feel of blues and the ethos of blues, and you add in the piano to it, right? It's a little mm-hmm. bit more improv because ragtime pianists can, you know, they could basically go off script, right? It's not set, and um, but it still has that, like, syncopated rhythm, right? That it's, it's by no means going, you know, off of the sound. It's got those galloping, you know, what would become a bass line and other things, but it's a bass line on a piano and stuff like that. Where and and you know that's where the piano comes in jazz, which is a huge part of it. Familiarity yeah, still, with that, guys. Yeah, there's still there's still patterns that you can pick yep. out. Basically, still very that's... structured, still very identifiable as you know what I mean. You, you you'd either love or hate it. You know what I mean, but you'd know what you love or hate, right? You know, it wouldn't right. be hard to define. Yeah, Matt, what would you say? What's your familiarity? Yeah, with Scott Chaplin. I mean, anybody would recognize you know some of his you know songs that was from i forget the names of it but it da, 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 da. yep mm-hmm. well there's like the enter the entertainer, entertainer right is yeah, the, yeah that was mm-hmm. the uh and it's in movies i mean that was a big thing in the yep. sting i think you know it was the main song yep. so yeah it's very familiar yep. with that. yeah, it's, yeah it, it has a very yeah direct progression right you know you know you kind of know ragtime when you hear it right it sounds very jing- jingly and stuff i guess and upbeat so then we get to like the 1900s, right? Not quite the 20s, which is the jazz age, right? But we're getting there. And that is where something first starts getting called jazz, which is the New Orleans sounds of jazz. And the best way to describe the New Orleans sounds of jazz is it sounds like a brass marching band. And now along with, you know, before we were talking about, you know, guitar parts and then piano parts. Now we're bringing in brass trumpets you know within the brass in particular and basically the the new orleans sound takes ragtime adds in those horns and they become even more syncopated right so they they bend the chords like in blues and have the singing but they also have the syncopation of ragtime and the cool thing with new orleans jazz is that's where you start to get the idea of these bands that are being built where lots of instruments are being you know, put in, especially a rhythm section, right? You know, basses, drums show up there. The piano and guitar are still there, banjo, right? All kinds of different stuff. And it also is where the idea of the jazz soloist comes into play, right? And so a lot of people think of like Duke Ellington, right? You know, or Louis Armstrong as being that sound. But really, Louis Armstrong is considered the Chicago version of it. And Duke Ellington is considered the New York version of it. And that is basically when you take that jazz from New Orleans and then you add stuff to it based on a region. So far, so good. Gotcha. Still kind of makes yep. sense. Okay. Yeah, it's, all bu- it's all building on each other. It's all building, right? And we're still quite a far way away from Eric Dolphy, but it will start to make sense, right? Because he's piecing this together. So yeah. then you take the New Orleans sound and then the people – you know, in Chicago, right? And both Chicago and New York are the next scenes. And you have to also understand that to to understand jazz, you also have to understand the black experience in America. So in the 20s, you're having the great flight north, right? And Chicago and New York represent two of the places that most represent 
where people, you know, flee, you know, flee to, right? right? So when you get to Chicago, you get Louis Armstrong and and different stuff like that, you know, and a lot of it's built around him because he's two different groups, hot fives and hot sevens, right? And how what the Chicago sound is like is that it's way more guitar driven, right? So in that sense, it's like the blues. It has the saxophone prominent, which, you know, that's how you can tell a Chicago sound right off the bat, right? You know what I mean? It's it's got solos and it's either got a trumpet or a saxophone solo. And then it changes the beat from a four four beat to a two four beat and instead of trying to explain that i think what we'll try to do is maybe in future jazz episodes we'll try to play a clip that shows the difference between a four four and a two four because that's going to be really important when we talk about john coltrane because that's what he operates off of um so there you go so how familiar are you guys with like that louis armstrong sound oh i mean i know louis armstrong from movies and yep I mean, I think there's. Yeah, I think I have peripheral before. awareness of a lot of these versions, you know, of these different types. You know, yep. it's not something I. There's not any version of jazz that it's like, oh, this is, uh, you know, I'm well versed in this. It's a little bit of everything, I think. But you may not be because we're building, right? And that's where I think free jazz. I don't think we are as well versed, which we pretty much all admit it. So I think working backwards is going to help us, right? So mm-hmm. the Chicago, the Chicago version leads to the New York version, which is the precursor to big band music and basically features the stride piano. And that's the big difference there. It's instead of the guitar, like the Chicago sound, the New York sound has the stride piano. And that's why you've got Duke Ellington there, right? Instead of Louis Armstrong. And that's where you get things like the Charleston, right? Or the Carolina shout, stuff like that. And, and when you hear that stride piano, you immediately know you've got New York jazz. Okay. So what? That, wait, what's a what's yeah. a stride piano? I didn't look that up. This what what like is the stride piano as a instrument? Yeah, is it a different type of piano? It's um it's a different type of sound of the piano. Um, I'm trying to think of like how to best describe the stride piano. Um, I it's a it's a style of playing the piano though. I it's can a style. Yeah, it's a style of playing the piano. I know it involves like the left hand. Um. It's uh, it's kind of built around the idea of it in many ways, and I don't want to go too far in this in case I'm too wrong, but it, it kind of almost functions like the, the bass line does in rock music, mm. right? And then you build around it with the big band. Um, that would be kind of an easy way to describe the stride piano. But it's a sound, and, and the music is built around that sound and builds off like, you know, sometimes a rhythm section, right? So then knowing that is really important because then you get into that swing and big band era and that lasts all the way until the end of World War II. And that is where most notably white people start playing jazz, right? (laughs) That's, Mm -hmm. that's how that starts to, you know, go out, which becomes a, you know, important thing because it starts to become more of a cultural phenomenon. Um, But it also sort of takes jazz out of being regional and makes it more mainstream, right? So dances are associated with it that, you know, the Charleston was there in the twenties, but you know, you put stuff together like that and these large bands are playing swing music, you know, your, your Benny Goodman's Cab Calloway, Count Basie, right? You know, and I think that's, that is the jazz sound that might be most familiar to people when they think of general jazz sound, even though it also can be called big band. And a lot of the names that people think of, right, you know, Benny Goodman, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, right? These are all like huge names in jazz, right? And I think that is when people first can start making a connection to what, you know, what free jazz is, because in many ways, free jazz or avant-garde jazz is a direct answer to that type of jazz, if that makes mm-hmm. sense, because that jazz is very, um, but in the world of jazz, it would be considered to be buttoned up, non improvisational, much more played for the masses, right? Whereas free jazz is basically about taking it back to, taking it back to the basics, but then also expanding it to an area that almost, um, almost kind of like what certain musicians do in terms of trying to create, you know, like, Oh, what Frank Zappa did, right. You know, trying to create music that's technically proficient, but also doesn't really belong to anything. Right. Yeah. So I think he uh, actually referenced Eric Dolphy as a, as a oh. influence or something on one, one thing I read. I mean, not surprising. I mean, it makes sense. And, and so then, then you get bebop, which runs from in the forties until 1950. And that is really the, 
precursor to free jazz because it's all improvisation. It's musicians playing music, uh, music for other musicians. It's the combination of players that make super bands, right? And basically, instead of, I think the quote I read was, instead of having like populist trappings, this is basically asymmetrical asymmetrical riffs not direct ones not four by four or two by four structures kind of going in different directions it sounds frantic and basically it's it's a purist version of it right and so even the people who played that type of music uh i think are more well known by their names than they are for their music that's like your thelonious monk you know your charlie parker right those folks Mm -hmm. Dizzy Gillespie is sometimes kind of known, but I think he's as much known for like the, he played the trumpet at puffy cheeks, right? As what he sounded like in some ways. So as that's going on, there's also a side, uh, side uh, type of jazz going on at the same time called cool jazz, which is smooth, relaxed, designed around bringing the listener into the fold and not alienating them. It's very technically proficient and has almost like a classical music sound. And that, Matt, is where you find Miles Davis. Yep. Yep. That's where you find Miles Davis. And it's important to note that while I'm sure Eric Dolphy would respect Miles Davis, Eric Dolphy's type of jazz is a response to taking bebop and expanding it and not playing cool jazz and certainly not playing, you know, big band music, right? And, and... You know, and then the final thing before free jazz is something called a hard bop. And hard bop is not so much a way of playing so much as it is considered, you know, jazz. It was felt that jazz had gotten sort of too much like classical music and too European and played for folks that weren't necessarily the roots of it. So hard bop is where they're like, let's go back to the blues. Let's add in some Afrocentric elements. Let's add in some singing and some soulful singing. And actually, Miles Davis dips into that a little bit down the road. But most notably for Dolphy, that's where John Coltrane exists, right? And so mm-hmm. he takes elements of that Afrocentric, you know, um, uh, type of music for the purists with the experimentation that came from bebop. And then that's what leads ultimately to um the the free jazz right now there will be some people that say there's something called modal in between but a lot of times modal is more the way it sounds as opposed to a different type of jazz right but that's where you know you see coltrane again so yeah and and that's kind of when we get to free jazz which is the area of there should be no you know it's perfect for the 60s right we should have no musical constraints multiple you know instrumentation everybody soloing while also not soloing at the same time and that's Mm -hmm. with and that's where i get to how i feel about the dolphy album right here the dolphy album i think is i listened to it probably five times and i listened to it five times because each time i listened to it for a different musician sometimes i listened for the drum sometimes i listened for the bass clarinet and the interesting thing about dolphy is when you dig into his work it's hard to get a hold on him because he doesn't play an instrument. Like, you know, Dizzy Gillespie plays the trumpet exclusively, right? He's playing the flute in some instruments, primarily the sax, the bass clarinet, basically anything in the woodwinds he can play. So it's hard to get a feel for what Eric Dolphy sounds like or is because he quite consciously is not right. And then even within it, he's making squeaks and doing overblows and then becoming incredibly proficient. And that is what's very interesting about this. It's a mix of technical proficiency mixed with something that almost sounds, you know, um, discordant as we talked about, but just almost um, like as if they're intentionally playing the wrong notes and not just on the, the brass, but also the drums go from, you know, keeping the time to, to soloing to almost being non-existent at points. And you can't guess mm-hmm. when it's going to be what, right. And that's, that's what I'd say. So I'm sorry I went so long right there, but I like feel like to understand this free jazz, you kind of have to understand what it was trying to reject. And a lot of what it's trying to reject is a lot of what probably our listeners think of as jazz to begin with. Right. And we could, I mean, there could be a whole separate top 100 of jazz albums and that's a whole rabbit hole, you know, separate to a lot of the music that we've listened to so far. Uh, that's kind of how I approach listening to this album too, not knowing anything. Uh, 
you know, doing any of the research beforehand, just to add a listen, you know, the first listen, the couple listens, you know, I just tried to identify different instruments and like th- this album may be considered difficult, but it, you know, it contains a, it's multi, you could listen to this. What am I trying to say? You can listen to this album like a hundred times and get something different out of it every time. Um, there's so much to, so much that you could pay attention to or kind of drift in and out and hear something different every time. Um, so I think it's valuable in that respect. Um, uh, the one thing that I kept uh, coming back to one interesting point, and I, I brought it up before, but jazz uh, tends to have familiar patterns and this type of jazz tends to obscure patterns that you can latch on to, And you can mm-hmm. definitely hear that in this album. Um, there's not a lot to grab onto, which can be jarring to a lot of people, uh, myself included, the first mm-hmm. time I heard this. Um, so go in prepared, I guess, is what I'm saying to the listeners that want to, you know, they want to try out this album or listen to it. Um, well, and there's a lot yeah. of empty space, too. Not like empty space in that one person soloing, right, and then hanging on to the note like you'll hear in other types of jazz, um, whether it be on a your trumpet or someone singing and letting it sit in. I'm talking like true empty space where you're only getting like a tit 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 on the hi hat and that's all you're getting or like a couple loose blows <laughs> of the bass clarinet and then it goes from that into like five pieces all playing these complex parts. Um, the the xylophone sound is also fascinating on this because it it it's almost like a bird flittering in and out of different tracks. Like mm-hmm. you know you just when you forget that it's there, it comes back with a vengeance. And you never would think that a xylophone could take the lead in any piece of music, but it, it's as important as anything else in this uh, piece of work. Right. And that's why I highlighted all the, all of the artists on the album, because they all have their place and you can all hear them at different times and they all have their own solos. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are, there are no choruses. There are no, no like bridges or, or anything like that for somebody. No, it's just they're just they're jamming, right? I mean, they're just. Like, yep. I mean, there's there's so, obviously there's some parts that they're you know it's like there's some structure to you know what the song is, but it's those those moments are short lived. I think it. I think the album almost opens up with it, you know, like a couple of um, you know, I think there's like a couple of instruments playing along with each other, but for the most part, it's it's not that, right? It's just breaking off very quickly after that and going on to do its own thing. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it is, it's it's a it's a it's a um, it's a tough listen. I think it going in prepared if, if this is something that you want to you know experience is 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 certainly advised um, and just being open minded. I think, um, but I also you know like I said for me it's it's I've not only that but I've got to be ready to do it. So I think maybe when I listened to it this week I don't I wasn't really ready at any time that I listened to it. So um, mm-hmm. it's, it didn't do much for me you know i mean i can certainly pick out yeah they're talented yes they are um you know i i i can see where you know you know how proficient everything everybody is but it's just it i can't say that this was a pleasant listening experience on, in any way for me um other than a couple of times it's like oh that's a, that was a cool little part right <laughs> right like right. a couple like a couple measures here or there or whatever even if it, i don't i can't even think you could say measures they're not really playing any specific time signature or anything like that but um yeah jazz is jazz is different it's tough i like i said i I like seeing jazz live um you know just going to some sort of bar club or even like a jazz brunch you know it's like oh it's kind of like it's nice background music to have um but uh this isn't that this isn't that type of jazz music yeah if you see this in a brunch if you hear this (laughs) in a brunch that's that that might turn some business away and and i can't stress enough how much it i think it I probably would have had a very similar experience to Matt if I didn't know this was coming. And what I tried to do was say, okay, let me listen to some of Eric Dolphy's other recordings to get a feel for it. But also it was sort of, I listened to a fair amount of Coltrane and I listened to a fair amount of Charles Mingus because those are the two people that lead to Dolphy in some ways. And what you notice quickly, for example, and we'll get into Coltrane in a couple episodes, but Coltrane's got the same frantic energy, right, that Dolphy's got, but he stays on a theme the entire yes. time. He hammers on the theme, and as a result, it's a much more linear 
and I think it, experience and it's an easier gateway. Whereas Dolphy's just, you know, he's somewhere for 15 seconds, then he's not, you know what I mean? And that makes it tough to listen to in isolation. But when you listen to it as a compare and contrast with Mingus and Coltrane, you're in a much better, you're in a much better position. And I think because I did that, I was able to appreciate I had to know what walls were being knocked down in order to appreciate how he was knocking down the walls. If that yeah, makes this, sense. Yeah. This is hard just to go into cold. Um, yeah. Like I said, I knew, you know, some jazz stuff. I, you know, got um, familiar with Coltrane, love Supreme familiar with some miles Davis um, and some other stuff. But yeah, I think the, the analogy that you said earlier, John, about this kind of being like calculus, like you got to build up to this. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's this is a hard you know for this to be the first jazz album that we're covering which also makes sense because probably a lot of the other jazz leading up to this was way before it right so especially in the 50s as you'll see a lot of like the jazz albums probably in the top the best ever albums you know being jazz albums in the 50s uh, much more prominent than than here but um yeah this if, if you're just starting off i would not recommend this i would probably put you know take you somewhere else first um you know, and probably this, this, this would take some leading up to, I think for, for people to get, including myself, I, I feel like, you know, it may be if I venture out a little bit more and then come back to this later on, maybe I'd appreciate it. But for right now, it's, it was borderline unlistenable for me. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I did not find it to be unlistenable. I, I also think it will be interesting as we talk about jazz to continue to reference what we've learned about jazz as we go along, which will be a cool little activity because for those listening, you know what I mean? We'll be able to also talk about what we learn on the fly. Cause I think a lot of what understanding jazz is listening to more of it and having frames of reference. Yeah. I didn't find it unlistenable, but I would, encourage people to set their expectations you know accordingly and small um just and just experience it and and get what you can out of it and just expose yourself to something different which is definitely what i did so yeah and if you're a if you're a musician who plays i think you're going to have a much as as pretty much everybody who i know who knows jazz very well tells me uh, stuff like this is going to be if you're a musician it's going to be a much quicker entree into it than if you are just simply a music lover who does not have the experience of playing instruments because you see all different layers and can understand the structures and the structures being destroyed and and Mm -hmm. improvised on much easier yeah you can start as soon as you start reading about this stuff you get a lot of music terms that i wasn't familiar with and and music ideas and things that were like way way above my head I would, my final thought would be, I would encourage uh, people to watch YouTube videos of him playing. Um, There's multiple ones out there of him in the bands playing. And it's like kind of extraordinary to see him like play a a bass clarinet. So, Gotcha. 